It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio, flavored with a dash of humor. Welcome to intelligent, irreverent talk about plants and the planet they grow on. Your questions, comments, and participation are always welcome on Facebook and Instagram at The Mike Novak Show and at Mike Now on Twitter. Good planets hard to find. Temperate zones and tropic climes. And true currents and thriving seas. Wind blowing through breathing trees. Strong ozone and safe sunshine. Well, good planets are hard to find. Good planets are in the main. Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Jet streams, perfect air. And here they are, Peggy Malecki and Mike Nova. Good planets are in the main. Right. And guess what day it is? What day is it? It's Sunday. It's Sunday, the first day of spring. Uh, Woo! Nice... All right, we didn't wait. Uh, uh, although that's going to come later. We are... actually, it's is very exciting now. Unless you're listening to us on uh, our podcast, delay. Nice light there, Peggy. <laughs> It's all over the place. You know, what? I bring my own. I bring my own spotlight. Okay, except you've got uh, some uh, weird uh, filter on it there. The gobo, as they called it in the back in the theater days. Um, no, it's called natural sunlight. It's called natural sunlight, um, and uh, it is the first day of spring. Unless you're listening on a podcast, in which case that was last week or the week before, or I, whenever. Yeah, wherever I could hear. actually say, hey, maybe this is like the Stonehenge thing coming through on Equinox. Um, sure, if that's what you need, okay, go for it. You, you know, like downtown Chicago, where they have the. Now I need to match that. See, I got the wrong color light here, so let's go to. Uh, that's. Uh, I, I, mean, I, I, could, I can fix it by pulling down the window shade, but that, that, that hey, doesn't. Uh, I'm not sure. I like that light better. Let's go back to this. No, that's too yellow. Let's go back to that. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> I'll just uh, sit back here. <laughs> we are going to spring actually occur. This is the coolest thing. Spring actually occurs during the show today at um, um, 1033 a.m. So we Central daylight time. We uh, are uh, going to do a countdown. We're we're ready. I've got I've got the world clock set up there, and uh, we will count down to now. And, and it's not climatological or meteorological spring. No, this is old school spring, which is spring, uh, which happens on the vernal equinox. It's Stonehenge, yes. Uh, um, and exactly, and that's why you have Stonehenge lighting uh, this morning. So, <laughs> <laughs> so in honor of spring the first day of spring 2022 we're going out to nebraska uh to uh, visit uh, a friend of ours uh at uh green school farms he's uh, our friend gary fair who is the farmer there uh and he's going to show us this is going to be really cool i'm I, folks stick around for this well you want to stick around for the show because when we welcome in spring there's a couple of treats that i'm going to give you uh i think you're going to enjoy peggy there's one of them you don't even know about again i'm going to sucker punch you with something uh but there's Uh we're going to count down to spring but then there's something else that i'm bringing to the show and if you want to see it you have to Uh stick around till uh 10 30 and uh our segment with meteorologist rick DeMaio, um who's going to report on some weird things going on uh, in the planet. I mean, Antarctica with, uh, spikes, temperature spikes of 70 degrees. It doesn't mean it got to 70 degrees. It means it's 70. It got de- to 10. 
Yeah. It, right, <laughs> because it was minus sixty. Um, so, uh, but it's it's some sort of weird atmospheric situation over, uh, that Noah was reporting about, and mm-hmm. Rick sent us stuff, and you 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 found it online. I saw it. Um, uh, we all we were all reading about it this week, and Rick's going to talk about that. In addition to reports that from um, from climate.gov that the drought in the U.S. is only going to get worse in 2022 Mm -hmm. and spread farther across the country. Um, And this is something we'll talk about with our farmer, Greg Fair, uh, as well this morning, because he's on the front lines of climate change and the U.S. drought on a small farm in Nebraska. So there's that coming on. uh, And then in between, sandwiched in between, I've come up with a name for our segment, our environmental news segment. Uh, that is, it's temporary. I think for now, we I don't know. Just, we might. Yeah, and I just thought of a couple of others too. So did I'll you see? See, if I don't come up with the the, to, if I don't prime the pump, nobody comes up with anything Since here. Nobody so, wanted valuable Wally prizes. I we know have it. To name the segment ourselves. We would have given away. I don't know about you, but a bunch of. Uh, sedges showed up on my doorstep step hmm. no you didn't get them possibility place nursery oh, they'll be showing up then. yeah show yeah up. i got a feeling they're showing up we might i might give away some sedges on on hmm. my show uh for people who want them in their yards because they're wonderful native plants and uh uh these uh in uh, these are are helpful to uh insects and birds um uh, so um uh, in fact i may grab one during a break and bring it over here and show you what they sent me. But at any rate, our, our environmental segment, we're going to be calling the green pages for now, like the yellow pages, only green. Um, okay. And what was the one you came I up came with? Up, um, variations of two, either the green zine or the green scene. Ooh, see? Now, if, that's why I had to prime the pump. We could also call it the Green Report. I had some other, another one that I don't think we can use, and I'm not even going to say it. No, uh, because you could, <laughs> could get us in trouble. Uh, but all right, all right, we need folks to vote on it. Do you like the Green Pages? Do you like the Green Report? Do you like the Green Zine? This is uh, this is jargony uh, for people who are in the magazine industry, or the Green Scene, uh, which is not so jargony. So uh, we'll we'll put all of those up there, and people can vote on them or come up with their own. Now that I, like I said, I've primed the pump. The green pages. I'm so, typing them. All right. So that said, uh, we want you to be around uh, for a ten o'clock because we'll be t- discussing that, and then we'll welcome spring, and then we'll welcome Rick DeMaio. But before then, we need to go out to Lincoln, Nebraska, to bring in our guest, Gary Fair from Green School Farms. Gary, good morning. How are you? Hey, good. Hey, I think uh, I'll vote for Green Scenes. That's my vote. Oh, okay. Okay. You get, we got, you, you get a vote. You definitely get a vote because you're on the show. You know, what can I tell you? You, you, you absolutely, you absolutely, because you're spending your Sunday morning here with us and wandering around your facility. Um, and, and how far outside of Lincoln, Nebraska are you, Gary? Yeah. So I'm about 15 miles North of Lincoln. Okay. Yep. And, and, uh, where do you live? So I, I, uh, I do still live in town. The plan is to eventually build a house out here. But as we'll talk about, you know, it's, it's a work in progress. So at this point, yeah, there's no, no real buildings out here. <laughs> and, and that's kind yeah. of the, that's part of the, the drill here. Part of the reason we've got yeah. you on the show to show, to tell people what it's like to be a small farmer in America, you know, in the heartland, you don't get more heartland than Lincoln, Nebraska, do you? That's right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Bread basket. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Mid- and, Midwest corn, corn belt, wheat belt, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you are a native of Nebraska. Is that right? I am. Yeah. I, gr- I grew up here a couple hours from Lincoln and um, went to University of Nebraska, moved around, uh, went to lived in some other states, lived overseas a couple times, but uh, eventually made my way back here. 
Um, and you were not, this is not something that was in your family and you said, I'm going to just follow in the footsteps of, of my parents and, and my family. You were a software engineer. And did I, did I not see Stanford University on your resume someplace? Yeah, I went to grad school at Stanford out in Palo Alto. That was pretty cool. Yeah, that was a long time ago. <laughs> well, yeah, but it, but it shows that you're no slouch either. You don't get into Stanford if, if you're, you know, a slacker. So, um, so what kind of work were you doing and how did that lead to agriculture? Yeah, I mean, the two are kind of disconnected, really. Um, yeah, I started out as a software engineer. I, I just wanted to be an engineer. I was always... Um, that always just captured my interest. I was good at math. And so, you know, um, I went into software engineering um, and worked at different companies, uh, you know, just doing doing software and not, not really thinking about too much else. I mean, I liked it. It was challenging and um, stimulating. Um, I studied artificial intelligence at Stanford and worked on some pretty cool AI projects. Um, wow. And um, that was back in the day before we had, you know, the ubiquity of, of iPhones and, and iPads and just being connected internet 24 seven. So um, it was more groundwork type of research, but um, it was, yeah, it was very stimulating and everything. Um, but that's kind of worlds away for my life right now. Um, I started I was living in Colorado, I, I guess, when, you know, the thoughts first started to enter my mind about food and food production. Um, my late wife and I would go to uh, farmer's markets there and just, you know, it was a fun thing to do, social outing, you know, fun to buy the fresh food and everything. We, we started learning, though, you know, and thinking more about, you know, what does it, what does it mean to produce food and why does that matter and where where does the food come from? You know, it doesn't just show up in grocery stores magically. So what is that process? And um, at, at some point moved back to Nebraska to be closer to family and for, for other reasons too, but um, just uh, continued that, that sort of mental intellectual journey about learning and that developed into more of a burning curiosity and, and desire to actually be a participant in the process. So, so it, it went from just being a consumer at the farmer's market to actually wanting to be a producer for the farmer's market. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was, boy, that's already, I would say about 10 years ago, I started to, to decide that I wanted to pursue this in earnest. And so... I knew I was going to have to build skills. I had no agricultural background. I mean, anybody that grows up in Nebraska is likely knows family or has some kind of extended family in farming. And that was a case for me. So I wasn't a stranger to rural landscape at all, but I did grow up in town. And for Nebraska, you know, I was a town kid. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I had no agriculture background, even though I did have relatives in doing like soy, soybeans and corn type farming. Mm -hmm. um, but it was always just, you know, visiting them on the weekends and, you know, running through the cornfield. It wasn't anything that I grew up with knowledge wise. So what I had to do was start building a network of people um, in uh, the type of agriculture I was interested in, which is, uh, you know, vegetables, producing uh, human food as opposed to, you know, field corn or soybeans that gets turned into ethanol or gets turned into high fructose corn syrup. So um, I, I was more interested in, in food that, uh, you know, is fresh and healthy that you buy at the farmer's market. So I, I started volunteering with uh, different environmental groups, including agriculture-based groups, and just getting to know area farms, uh, helping out getting my feet, uh, you know, getting my hands dirty a little bit and just to kind of test the waters whether that was something I would actually enjoy. And then so let's see, 2014, I took a uh, introductory course that was offered by the University Extension. Um, it was just called a Farm Beginnings course and it was just a short course where they brought in speakers from local farms and from supporting organizations just to describe 
you know, um, what's all involved, the different issues, different topics, different segments of, of production. And um, that same year then, I uh, volunteered as an intern or apprentice, whatever you want to call it, on an area farm. It was an organic vegetable farm. And so I volunteered there for a season. I worked with them a couple days a week. Um, I was still working full time. So a couple days a week, I would go out and just help them and learned all the aspects from start to finish about how they did vegetable production. So in, in an organic setting. So, and, and was that something that you wanted to pursue from the get-go, which is uh, organic slash regenerative slash sustainable kinds of gardening yeah. or farming? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that was an essential part of it because, you know, the learning I, I did, you know, uh, uh, during this whole time, and I'm still learning, but it's just, uh, you know, recognizing the the huge environmental impact that agriculture has on the world. I mean, if you think about all the the land that's under agricultural production to feed, you know, all the people in the world. And so, uh, you know, on, a thousand years ago, there weren't that many people in the world. So it didn't matter what methods you used. And, and that was all organic anyway. But once you got into the modern age and we started to try and take shortcuts with, you know, chemical production based production, um, sooner or later, those types of approaches are catching up with us and, you know, polluting groundwater. And uh, according to the Rodale Institute, you know, we all have measurable levels of pesticides in our bodies now and things. So, yeah, so for, from the beginning, it was important for me to, to take a, um, an approach that was more um, organic based or fully organic based. You know, it's it's interesting. One of the stories that Peggy and I are going to be uh, talking about uh, at 10 o'clock is uh, one that she passed along to me about how glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, is now found in more and more of our food. Uh, and this is yeah. exact, exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, right. Environmental Working Group just came out with a new study of how much they found in places you wouldn't even expect. Right. Uh, so, uh, right. so here, but at some point, you know, and I'm, and you know, if it had been me and I'm out there working in these fields, uh, I, I might say, you know, I really enjoyed that software work. Uh, maybe I'm going to go back to, uh, AI cause you know, AI is really big now and maybe I can make a lot of money doing that. Um, do you ever look back and think, wow, uh, I, I might have ridden this wave and, um, been, you know, buying million dollar homes, uh, out on the coast or something like that, man, just last week I thought that, but, uh, <laughs> I, and then the thought you know, passed and you kept on yeah. going <laughs> like, no, I, I would rather kill myself pulling weeds and, you know, <laughs> um, no, but, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah, it's, it, it was a much easier life. And there's there's something to be said for a steady paycheck with full benefits, obviously. So um, I, I, I kind of, I don't know if there's something in me that has to do things the hard way or what. But <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's just, it was the challenge of, you know, can I make this work? And it was also this sort of there's lots of reasons I went into, you know, giving this a shot. Um, this is going to be my eighth season growing. And so there's been lots of reasons I did this. And, and one of it was like, for myself, I just got tired of sitting at a desk, staring at a computer mm -hmm. screen. It was like humans aren't meant to be sedentary like that. We're meant to move around. We're meant to interact with the earth. We're meant to, you know, dig in the dirt. And I know not everybody likes that. Not everybody can, can do that. I'm not judging anybody for whatever lifestyle they choose. But for me, I wanted that tangibility of like pointing to the field and saying, hey, I grew that um, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, searching a database all day or something. Um, it just, it started to feel um, unfulfilling, I guess. Well, and I'm going to yeah. guess that uh, when you look at your blood pressure uh, and uh, your other uh, bodily functions, uh, you're a lot healthier now than you were eight years ago. I, I mean, I think so. You know, I, I'm moving all day. It's not, it's not, you know, like I'm not running or it's not aerobic exercise, but yeah, I'm moving all day. Um, it's, it's easier to keep the weight down and, um, I'm eating, you know, 
my own organic, uh, organically produced fresh food. So, I mean, what could be better? I, I love this. I mean, I wouldn't trade this for a paycheck for any, uh, for a steady paycheck for, you know, for mm -hmm. anything. All right. Well, let's yeah. talk. Uh, go, go ahead, I was going to say we've got a, we, we have a comment, um, Gary, from one of our viewers. This is actually coming from Blazing Star. Um, wish there were more people like Gary in our country, they say. So there you go. Oh, that's really nice. And we need uh, we need small farmers. That's that's for sure. Uh, I mean, I, 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 there's so much going through my mind. In a second, I want to get to uh, you telling us about making the leap and, and getting the land that you have. But yeah. for t the thing that popped into my head, and I've been doing this for 25 years now, this show in various permutations, starting with you know Gargantua Radio down the dial, which was WGN, and and other places. And the argument that has been made for 25 years that I keep hearing is the the big ag folks say there's no way we can field or, or I'm sorry feed the world without our the chemicals and the uh, the big farming and uh, the little guy saying no it can't be done. Where do you stand on that uh, argument or that question, Gary? Yeah, that that is a great question, and and it it is it's the central question that's thrown around all the time. And I want to preface what I, you know, what I say with these are my opinions and I don't pretend to be an agriculture expert. I am still very much learning and sometimes it feels like I don't, I don't you know, I still don't know what I'm doing. But, um, you know, that's what makes life so exciting, right, is you get to learn all the time. So on the question of production, I mean, just a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is, you know, the, the idea that we can't have... Uh, the level of production we need to feed the world unless we're using chemicals. And so I, I read an interesting article that, that sort of talked about that. And it said that the, when, when we do side-by-side -side comparisons, uh, and there have been side-by-side -side comparisons, so Rodale Institute is an organization that does that ongoing. They do side-by-side -side trials of organic production versus conventional production. And uh, interesting article that, that kind of deconstructed that myth. And uh, myth, I, I, I wanna be careful about using the word myth. Deconstructed that, that topic um, by, by noting that conventional agriculture is optimizing for uh, minimal labor. It's optimizing for production by minimizing labor. And so if you are trying to use, uh, get the same output on a field through, you know, uh, chemical spraying, chemical fertilizers, and then you turn over to the next field and expect that same level of production with the same amount of labor input, um, you are, and it's organic, you are likely to have less production because the variable you're trying to minimize for is labor. You're trying to minimize labor and have one person be able to, you know, do that thousand acre farm, um, that person is, if they turn immediately to do the same thing with organic production, of course, they're going to have increased weed pressure. How are they going to manage that by hand? So the, if instead though, you broke up that thousand acres into a hundred 10 acre farms, and now you have a hundred families that are each making a living and able to more intensively manage the weeds through methods other than chemicals, in fact, you may easily get more production out of that same thousand acres. And you're so feeding it, people at the same time. You're feeding these families at the same time. You're, and you're, you're probably families. seeing a gain in nutrition. Yeah, all of those things. And you are now providing employment for 100 families versus mm -hmm. one. Yeah. So I, I'm not saying that's the whole story. And again, I'm not an expert economist. It's just those are the things that come to mind when I think about that question. Uh, that's a wonderful answer. All right, Gary, uh, before we get to the break, I want to talk a little bit. First of all, it's a spring day. It's the first day of spring. Temperatures yep. are, are pretty much in the 30s right now, right? Uh, right now, yeah, it's probably 30, 40 this morning. Yeah, kind of okay. chilly. Okay, and it's going to get up to what today? Uh, they said se uh, 72, something like that. <laughs> so you're going to go up 30 degrees at least in the course yeah. of the day. Uh, and that's part, yeah. of, part of the deal. Being a farmer is dealing with whatever right. the weather's throwing at you. 
Yeah, I'll have my coat off here in about an hour. So. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, or if you walk into the hoop house, you'll have your coat off. Yeah. yeah. Spe <laughs> speaking of the hoop, and by the way, good job on the selfie stick. Uh, Gary okay. Gary went out and bought himself a selfie stick. Uh, <laughs> I can't believe how you're you're just a pro in uh, in yeah. one day, your first time out. You know, I worked in technology, you know, 30 plus years, and I feel like such a, a doofus sometimes, you know, <laughs> with the little things like a selfie stick. Uh, oh so gosh. let's let's wander over uh, to okay. the yeah. uh, green. And I was gonna, okay, and I was going to ask, is that all kale behind you from last year? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so obviously there's nothing. We're, we're too early to have most things going yet. But right. so right. Uh, be, behind me is just the, the, the kale and then next to it, the slightly taller things. Those are Brussels sprouts. Yep. Um, and I I sort of intentionally leave the beds um, sort of, you know, with the residue there over the winter just to provide some ground cover, help prevent erosion. Um, and then behind me here, I don't know if you can. Yeah, we can kind of see rows, that. Th those rows are were bell peppers. Um, that was kind of fun this year. I partnered with the University of Nebraska. They did. Uh, they they worked with some area small farms like myself, and they did some field trials of different pepper varieties. They wanted to measure the yield and size of different pepper varieties. So that was pretty cool. They provided the pepper pepper varieties. Um, nice. And then they had uh, students would come out and scout for, for um, you know, yield and disease and pest pressures and see which performed the, the best. We're going to do a second round of that this year. So that was pretty fun. Fantastic. All right. Now, you're on 20 acres. Obviously, not all of it is vegetable. Some of it, right. we're going to see a little bit of a prairie that you've put in. Uh, yeah. And we're going to see this uh, greenhouse which does not have vegetables in it and seedlings in it now. And right. why, why is that? <laughs> <laughs> that is because uh, there are not enough hours in a day to, <laughs> to do everything I want to do. Um, so, yeah, big, a big part of what I'm doing right now, which is not we're not going to see today, but it's uh, just growing plants. And so I do spring plant sales for, area, for, for people that want to you know, have gardens. So I grow tomato plants, mm -hmm. pepper plants, cucumbers, whatever. Uh, about 50, well, about 100 different varieties of vegetables and herbs I grow. And that's a big part of my spring uh, revenue is, is plant sales. So um, this year or before this year, I've been renting a greenhouse space from another organization in Lincoln. And that's where I would grow all the plants. And then um, in January, I started building this um, out on my place. I had hoped to get it finished uh, in, in time to, to do plant starts this year. Uh, but you know, it, that's the way it goes. It, it just didn't quite get finished. Um, you know, you can see that the, the end walls, there's no plastic on it yet. So, um, I'm going to have to, you know, I keep working on this until I get, until I can get a propane furnace in here to keep it above freezing at night and get the ventilation fans all wired up and all that. So I got a little bit of work to do yet, but, um, this is going to be great because it's going to give me so much more space to spread out and and increase that part of my business in the spring. Um, and do you expect to have it? How soon do you expect to have it done? I mean, I would like to have it done by April 1st. We'll see if that happens. And if it is done by April 1st, uh, I assume you'll be able to use it for something this year. I, I could start staging plants in here. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, it, it has to be heated though, because even in April here, um, you know, there are nights when it can drop down below freezing and that would just, yeah. you know, kill most of the plants. So, yeah. Uh, and, uh, I was, uh, looking at your Facebook page at it was what January 6th when you were, when you got a hold of the materials for this and you were telling people, come on out and help me put up yeah. my, uh, my greenhouse. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. assu I assume you got a decent response to that. Oh yeah, you know, I mean that is so that is so rewarding to just be a part of the local food community because yeah, I put a I, I put some requests out for some volunteer work days to just help, you know, get the get all this erected and put up and especially the big sheet of plastic, get that pulled over the top and secured. And um, you know, it's just so amazing to know that there are so many people willing to, you know, to come out and help. And these are 
these are fellow uh, farmers or they're you know loyal customers who believe in the in the in local food and what that represents and you know i again i would not trade a desk job for anything in the world just because of how rewarding gratifying this is to to just know that that i can be a small part of this whole thing that's fantastic all right well that's a that's a good point for us to do a, a quick break here we're talking to gary fair who's with green school farms in, just outside of lincoln nebraska uh when we come back gary uh i want to show folks a little bit more of the territory maybe you can walk over to yep. the prairie uh and we've yep. got we've got some machinery that we're going to uh and we're going to show people what it's like for a small farmer to be doing this more or less on his or her own uh it's the mike novak show with peggy molecki please stick around this is really fun One of the keys to the success in being able to grow tomatoes all year long is our Procyon 2.0 light. We use a 17 inch Procyon light above each of the tomato plants and it's a light which gives you the right intensity of light that's required to grow a tomato as well as the right ratio of red to blue to green light to make the flowers properly blossom and to produce large amounts of tomatoes. From spring seed and soil treatments to summer foliar feeding to fall stubble digesters, Blazing Star provides microbial tools from tiny old biologicals for natural and organic farmers. They have solutions for home gardeners too. And Blazing Star offers agroecological education and consulting especially for permaculture work in Zones 4 and 5. Learn more about these great folks at blazing-star.com. Imagine if you could walk out your back door and pick a juicy tomato. Imagine if kids living in food deserts had access to a garden and all the fresh veggies they could eat. Imagine if every city, every neighborhood, every local park Every patio, every windowsill had a vegetable growing. Imagine what that could do for our food system. Imagine what that could do for kids around the world. We need to get kids outside planting in the soil so they connect to nature. They connect to the future of their world. Planting a seed on Plant a Seed Day matters. So join me and our growing big green family around the world and plant a seed. Plant a seed on Plant a Seed Day And today is Plant a Seed Day, mm -hmm. uh, in <laughs> case you didn't know that. And Gary, that I hope uh, you plant a seed somewhere today. Of course, you've, you've planted a lot already, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of plant, yeah, in the seed trays. But maybe we'll plant some arugula here on the show. How about that? Uh, that might be great. I think that would be fabulous. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the link, if you go to MikeNovak.net, go to my blog post uh, and scroll down uh, where we have the green pages, uh, and we're still getting suggestions for what we're going to call that segment. Uh, you will find the link to Plant a Seed Day. Basically, it is plantaseedday.org. And today, the 20th of March, 2022, is Plant a Seed Day. And we'll talk about another day that's coming up on Tuesday, but that's later in the show. All right, we're back with Gary Fair from Green School Farms in Nebraska. Uh, let uh, describe your farm. You've got about 20 acres there and, and Yeah. No, go ahead. No, no, you go you tell me what's there. Okay. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, man, man, that I hit the wrong button there. I meant to go to yeah. Yeah, uh, that boy, that happens. Had another little, another little break. Okay. Yeah. No. 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 Um, no. We're we're done with that. So this is the button I meant to hit. He Here we are. Coffee. He just wanted coffee. Okay. That's yeah. All. Okay. So Gary, <laughs> yeah. as I was saying, please tell us about your farm. Take it away, Gary. Okay. <laughs> right. So I I bought this back in 2016, and um, it took a couple years to make it uh, usable before I could farm it because we had to put in um, electricity run. The rural power district had to run electricity to the site so that we could operate a well. 
and then I had to get a well drilled and uh, for water to, you know, for irrigation. So I'm just kind of rotating around here, but it's um, it's 20 acres, which is, you know, it's a it's uh, it's not what most people think of when they think of a large farm in in, uh, in the Midwest. You know, where you know most farms, you know, you think of several hundred acres at least. So 20 acres is definitely not a farm in the sense of you know, hey, we're going to grow corn and soybeans on here. Um, you need so much more space to grow a uh, economically feasible amount of that. So a small acreage like this is. Um, in my case, I right now I'm I'm at about uh, less than an acre of vegetables, so that's only a you know small part of the whole place. The rest of it, like what I'm standing in here right now, is an alfalfa field. So I have about an acre of vegetables, about uh, 12 acres of alfalfa, which um, is baled and sold um, sold uh, you know as a, as a supplementary source of income, and then. Um, I'll walk backwards here. And then um, about uh, 2018, I uh, seeded five acres to recreate a uh, prairie. So I seeded five acres in, in a mix of native grasses and flowers, forbs. And um, I wanted to do that for you know several reasons. One being that we have lost virtually all of the native prairie in the Midwest that was here 200 years ago. And um, with that, we've lost tremendous number of species, uh, birds, small animals, insects. And I wanted at least to put back a little bit of that to bring back pollinators, to bring back habitat for small creatures. And, and just, you know, for an aesthetic, um, I don't know how well you're going to be able to see this, but um, this is obviously it's dormant right now. But this is what in eastern Nebraska it's called tall grass prairie. Mm -hmm. um, you get towards western Nebraska, then it switches into transitions into short grass prairie, and it's mostly a uh, mostly a, uh, a factor of how much rainfall there is and what grass species it can support. So. The dominant grasses in this are um, big blue stem, little blue stem, and Indian grass. And then you have um, a mix of uh, forbs or flowers of, uh, I think the mix I got, there was supposedly 200, uh, 200 different species of grasses and flowers. And so um, seeing a lot of those emerge and uh, it just takes a while to get established. Uh, the first three years after we seeded this, it just looked, it was just a field of weeds. Um, we didn't do any control, we didn't spray, didn't do anything. We just cleared the ground, uh, broadcast the seed by hand. I had some friends and family come out. We took seeds in five gallon buckets and just walked over the five acres, spreading the seed the old fashioned way, uh, which mm -hmm. was incredibly rewarding and connecting to the earth. And, um, yeah, the next three years, it just looked like a complete failure because there were just regular annual weeds that had took it, taken over because we didn't do any weed control. And that was by design. Um, and, you know, I, I consulted with a group in Nebraska that puts in prairies in, with this method, and they assured me that was a natural course. And so, uh, lo and behold, last year started to see these clumps of native grasses just appearing. It was just like magic. Uh, they just started appearing because it had taken that long for them to put down roots and to just get established. And they have now outcompeted all of the weeds. There are virtually no weeds in this field now. It's just, it's just utterly astonishing to me as I keep learning about this. Yeah. So Gary, there's a couple of comments from a couple of our people watching. Um, one, Amy says, thanks for your dedication to bring back pollinators in prairie habitat. Um, Andrew is asking, what do your big corn and soybean neighbors think of you? Are they supportive and helpful or are they skeptics? <laughs> um, I, uh, this land is, well, so yeah, how do I answer that question? I mean, I <laughs> carefully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no. There's different. There's different. The the reason that I chose this property in particular 
is because all of I, I want to get certified organic um, hopefully soon. I don't know. I've, I've given up on putting a timeline on myself on that. But to become certified organic, you have to be mindful of the whether your property borders fields that are being sprayed and uh, because of concerns about drift of pesticides right. and, and herbicides. Mm -hmm. And so um, I chose this property specifically because on every side except one, uh, it's bordered by others, uh, either hay fields, which typically aren't sprayed, or residential acreages. So this is kind of a peri-urban area out here. You have people who like to just live in the country, so they have acreages. So there's not a lot of uh, you know danger of uh, drift. Now there is one neighboring uh, corner that kind of that that does abut my property, but um, it's a it's a tenant farmer. I've met the person who owns the property, but I haven't met the tenant farmer themselves, and so um, it's it's never really been an issue. Um, I will say that the person who comes and hays my alfalfa field, he's an older gentleman and um, he's, he's, not, he's not organic, he's conventional, but uh, we get along so well, he, you know, he'll kid me about why do you wanna do all this work? Why are you doing it the hard way? And yet he will then at the same time say, oh yeah, I remember back you know, when I was young, we didn't have those chemicals, so we did it the old fashioned way. So to him, organic is the quote, old fashioned way. And so he has respect for that. And, you know, we get along. Uh, that's, uh, that's good to know because uh, I know other people who have uh, areas of natural land and they abut farms uh, here in Illinois. And drift is always an issue. Uh, so you, it sounds like you made a pretty smart choice. As you're wandering back over to the truck, because I guess we want, we're going to do our demonstration. Oh, I wanna, yeah. I want to get uh, very quickly as you're walking, uh, talk about your commitment uh, to uh, farm to school. Okay, so one component of my business and one is farm to school and what farm to school means, it means several things. But for me, what it means basically is, is um, getting food, fresh, healthy food into uh, area school cafeterias. And so I've partnered with some of the uh, smaller schools here uh, to get, you know, they'll purchase food from me at a wholesale price, and then they will feature that in their in their uh, cafeterias, um, and that's incredibly rewarding. And that also means that you know sometimes I'll have a, a tour of of food staff people come out just to see, you know, where this food is coming from, how it's produced, or occasionally I'll go into a school to you know just present to kids like. Hey, you know, what are these tools? Your parents have gardens. You recognize any of these tools, you know? So uh, that's fun too. And it's, so it's all about educating kids about where the food comes from and, and about healthy eating and just trying to get them interested in healthy eating habits. Um, and schools are becoming increasingly uh, aware and, and concerned about that too. So um, yeah, farm to school is is really important. I mean, I named my farm Green School Farms, green as an environmental um, element, schools and farms uh, to try and connect those. And so I work with uh, not only schools, but I've worked with other nonprofits in Lincoln to try and build up a network where, you know, multiple farms can supply schools with a, uh, you know, a supply chain of, of healthy produce. And yeah. so- you work with a uh, partnership for a healthy Lincoln. I also know right. that you, you've and donated that. food to, we can do this. We feed the kids at mm -hmm. F street community center every weekend. Yeah. And I love the title yeah. of that. <laughs> yeah. 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 And the harvest of the month program that you're involved with again, with partnership for healthy Lincoln. Right. Yeah. Harvest of the month is fun. It's a, it's a, so Nebraska department of ed uh, produced a list of, of 12 vegetables. Well, 12 products, I think, uh, there's there's some like meat on there too. I don't have any livestock, so. Um, but yeah, harvest of the month is is a way to so it'll feature a vegetable each month, let's say. And so, you know, April is going to be spinach. And so we we find farms that are you know producing spinach this time of year, um, and then we uh, 
you know, we'll, we'll get the quantity they need. And then the kids taste it. They set out the spinach in little portion cups and the kids go through the line and, and the kids that taste it, they get a little sticker that said, Hey, I tasted the spinach or I tasted the broccoli or I tasted the, <laughs> you know, the, the beets nice. or whatever. And so it, it gives the kids, you know, they get that little sticker. So they want to try the vegetable and, and it makes it seem less um, scary to them about, Ooh, broccoli, you know? Um, yeah. It makes it fun for them. It, it makes it fun. Right. And, and you know, so, we, sh we should point out that March is uh, national, national nutrition month. Um, uh -huh. So this, this all ties in uh, right now uh, to what you're doing. We're getting a little bit of wind. You might want to change the angle here. Okay. There yeah, we wind's go. starting to pick up just a little bit. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, let's uh, I think one of the things people might be interested in <laughs> is what it's like to have to plant stuff. All right. There you're out there. You don't have the big tractors and you don't have the big right. machinery. How do you plant uh, uh, an acre in uh your or on your farm right so um sorry for the angle here i'm trying to get this set up so we can do a little demonstration but um yeah so vegetable production is quite different than say corn or soybeans because corn or soybeans because of the economies of scale required you know you do need a thousand acres to produce uh you know a, 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 any kind of you know <laughs> feasible amount of corn um but vegetable production is much more intense and um, you can get so much more, it, it's higher value. You know, you get $3 for a bunch of kale, uh, the same amount of space growing an ear of corn, field corn would be what, maybe a penny for that ear of corn. So it's an entirely different scale of economics. And so that's why there are so many small vegetable farms that are viable is because you can, when you farm more intensely on that small space, you're able to capture a much larger uh, you know, living wage uh, amount of, of revenue. And so a lot of farms, uh, vegetable farms my size, say one to three to five acres, they're not going to have big machinery. And, and that's partly intentional. One, it costs less to, you don't have to have a lot of machinery to maintain. I personally would rather be connected to the earth through more directly than just sitting inside of a tractor cab all day. Uh, that's just my preference. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, scale scale is intentional uh, to some degree. And so I don't have, I had a tractor that had belonged in our family. It just, I kept it for a while and it just wasn't suited to the precision work you need for doing vegetable beds where you need a lot more control. Um, and so I, I sold it back to my uncle. I just, I didn't need it. And so what I did instead is I bought this and this is really the largest piece of equipment I own. It's called a, a BCS walk behind tractor. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, I, I'm not sure if it was, I think these are produced in Italy. Um, this is a really common implement in uh, Europe for um, vegetable production and just farms are a lot smaller average size over there. But we'll see if we can, um, you know, show you how this works. But basically it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a, a rototiller on steroids. It, it has a, a, a powerful uh, Honda engine in it. And then there's different attachments you can uh, attach to it for different types of tillage and brush clearing and um, just bed preparation. So, all right. All right. And then we'll do, you, do you use a cedar as well? Uh, yeah. And then I use a, um, for, for direct seeding, I use a, um, We'll, we'll fire there. It's not, it's not a powered unit, but, um, it's, it's called a, a Jang cedar. It's, um, uh, it's just a rolling cedar, the seeds in a hopper, and then you can, um, quickly or, or quicker than, but than just doing it by hand, you can seed rows of, you know, radishes or turnips or, yeah. or arugula or whatever. Well, let's see if we can uh, set up that camera the way we we, okay. we, we practiced this before the show. Uh, we'll see how, and I'll tell you when uh, you've got that aimed correctly. Yeah, sorry, let me. That's okay. He's a one man band, even with his yeah. self selfie stick and uh, and cell phone. 
Yeah. That's, yeah, pr- that's pretty good. Of, okay. Okay. Let me, let me fire this up. So what we're going to do here is um, the, I don't know if you can tell, but the, the beds here haven't been prepped at all. So we have, we have some beds and we're just going to, the, the attachment I have on here right now is called a power harrow. And it's just a series of blades that spin vertically and they just kind of stir up the top couple inches of soil. And I could talk a lot about the, the reason we don't do deeper tillage, but if we have time, we can get into that. But anyway, so I'm just going to go down the, the bed here for a, a few feet and just show you how I prep a bed. And then we'll bring in the cedar and we'll seed some arugula in here. And then a month from now, you guys can come out and have some salads. So. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Not just arugula, though. That would be a little spicy. Yeah. Well, there's all sorts of stuff you can do with arugula. It goes nice with, like, corona beans and some asparagus when that comes in. I'll give you the recipe. There you go. Love listening to that cardio in the background, too, yeah. He's riding side saddle there. Yep. So Deb Moulton says road trip for salad. I'm not sure. Well, I guess for a good salad, you you could do a road trip. Yeah, but there's 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 road trip and there's road trip. You get to meet Gary and hang out on the farm and have some salad. All right. So, so uh, I don't know. If you, I don't know how that turned out. It, no, it, it's per, it was perfect, Gary. Take the camera now and show us the soil. Bring it. Do do a close up okay. of the soil so we can see what the uh, okay. machine yeah, has what, done what there. Did there. Yeah. Right. So. Okay. So if you can, if you can see down there. Yeah. Uh, what happened is that there's a lot of early season weeds that have already started emerging. And so Mm -hmm. by stirring that up, it's, it's, you know, pulled up these weeds and clumps. And again, I don't know if you can see that, but it's real. All right. All right. I'll tell you what, go, but go back towards the truck. I think we're, we're kind of losing the signal here. Um, okay. I don't know why, but it seemed better over there. Uh, the signal's not quite as good now as it was earlier, but um, yeah, you, it's uh... well. At least we got to see the uh, the machine in in action there. Yeah, um, and then you will take your cedar and run it over that area. Uh, well, I guess I guess we're not going to get a chance to see that. Uh, this morning, I don't know why, but all of us. But this is the these are the vagaries of cell reception. Um, but I think we still got your audio, so I think you can keep talking, Gare. Oh, okay. I'm just trying to get to a spot. There's some spots out here that typically have, uh, you know, get. Yeah, it's getting better. I mean, I've got. I'm at three bars now, so I don't know if that's. Well, you know, it's okay. Well, as long as we have the audio, we're good. Uh, we only have a few okay. more minutes left anyway, but and now you're, okay. uh, and, and now it looks like we're back. Uh, and, okay. uh, and now you've got the shipping container. Tell us about the shipping container behind you. Yeah, so I, I needed someplace just to store equipment, so I brought in a used shipping container uh, uh, um, early on, and that's just where I store things. Um, off to the side of it, I, I built a little lean-to, out of some lumber and what I use that for is I use that to that's my wash pack station so again really low tech but very typical of farms my size is um, it's just it's got you know benches and storage space it's got washing uh, equipment and um, drying racks and that sort of thing so it's um, it doesn't look like much but um, I just you know I was talking to you Mike earlier and just 
this is very typical of a, of a one to two acre vegetable yeah. production type of approach. Uh, well, um, now tell me, um, so folks have a better understanding, you, you, when you were uh, holding the soil, you were breaking up a little bit. You said, what were you saying about that soil? Uh, it's just, it's, it's got a really nice ch texture right now. And so this is, um, you know, we had about an inch of rain a couple days ago, and um, it's been very dry this winter. So, but we did have a couple of rains in the last month that, have really soaked in nicely and so um, I just love that it's the the texture the the word is tilth t-i-l-t-h so mm -hmm. the tilth of the yeah. soil right now is um, it's really nice and so you want that sort of fine even consistency for sowing small seeds like arugula i don't know if we'll be able to do that if we're going to lose a signal if i go back over there so. you know what i think we're fine because we only have a few okay. more minutes left yeah. and and we do know you're going to use that little uh, machine roll out yeah. uh, the seeds yeah. what about uh cultivating as the plants grow do you have anybody uh who helps you on the farm yeah i have i do have one um part-time helper um, she comes out about five to ten hours a week and typically like on a Saturday as we get into growing season uh, Typically she'll come out on Saturday and help harvest for the market on Sunday and then Sundays She'll help uh, run the booth at the farmers market So I do I do three I did three markets last year I'll probably do those and I may add part of another market this year. So D D Do you make uh enough at the farmers markets to get by well <laughs> that's yeah that's uh that's also uh so i did this this is my eighth season but it's only going to be my second season where i'm completely quit my desk job so i i quit my desk job i went down to part-time for a few years but that's still only it was difficult to find enough time to you know grow enough and sell enough so last year was the first time where I finally bit the bullet and just, you know, quit my desk job. So I did, uh, I saw a dramatic increase in sales simply because I had more time to show up, harvest and show up to sell it. And so I expect, I hope that trend continues this year. Yeah. Um, I am not able to cover all my personal expenses yet. So I am, you know, relying on savings and some investments and everything. So um, it, uh, but, but yeah, the goal would be to, to get to at least to a break even point. Yeah. Do you have a little farm stand as well at the farm if people come during the week for vegetables? Uh, no, I, I, uh, I haven't tried that yet. Um, I guess I'd kind of like to, to wait until I'm living out here for some of that stuff okay. to, yeah, you know, you issues either, of vandalism yeah. or yeah. whatever. But, um, yeah, I haven't tried that. Although I guess I could great idea. <laughs> what, a lot what, of people do that yeah um one of the things uh before we go though um we we just touched on drought you're kind of in the middle of an area of the country that has been experiencing drought. and i'm sorry you lost your your selfie stick there somewhere along the way and now you're no i've got it back oh you got, got it back it. okay great yeah. um what how have you been dealing with the drought how has it affected your farming yeah i i was just looking at a drought drought uh, website last night um so we really hadn't had any precipitation to speak of since October, um, with the exception of, like I said, in the last um, three weeks, we've had two rainfalls that were each about an inch uh, each. So, uh, but I was looking at the, uh, the university has a, um, a drought watch website that they sort of monitor drought. And um, the Lincoln area is classified right now as in a moderate drought. I was a little surprised at that. It seemed like it would be more extreme, but apparently we've had enough dribs and drabs of precipitation that, you know, at the time didn't seem to amount to anything. Anyway, so, so we're in a moderate drought. Um, yeah, that's, that, that's a question. And we all, we, none of us know the answer about how climate change is gonna affect that. Um, you know, climate change, some areas could actually be more moderate instead of, you know, more extreme. That's just, and, and some areas are going to get more extreme and overall things are going to get more extreme. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
I, I don't I don't have a great answer for that. I mean, there are arid farming techniques that we all need to become better at. So, for example, heavy mulches will retain moisture much better than leaving bare soil. Um, and uh, there are farms uh, out west in the U.S. that there are not many, but there are vegetable farms that are trying to experiment with uh, so-called dry land farming, where they literally don't irrigate. They only rely on, on the rainfall that comes. And they make use of heavy mulches that retain soil, mo soil mo moisture. Um, I've noticed the compost pile, I make my own compost. And even in this drought, when you dig down into the middle of that compost pile, it has been you know several feet of cover over it. It's very wet. So even in you know the several months that we've had no rain virtually, um, the, it it retains moisture very well. So there there are things to mitigate it. Well, uh, Gary, I can't tell you how wonderful this has been. This has just been fabulous, and and I and I think our viewers appreciate it. Um, I have to tell you that Amy Bartucci, who's been on our show and is with the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition, says you need to run for office. Uh, somewhere, somewhere. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> you that, that just that just sent a wave of anxiety through me. So, <laughs> but, uh, but I I appreciate the sentiment. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would vote for you. Uh, I would I would even move to Nebraska to vote for you. So, uh, okay. <laughs> at, at least for a couple of weeks, and then come back to. Uh, to my home. Uh, Gary Fair, uh, thank you so much. Um, good luck this with the growing season good luck because the season. Yes. You, you know, it looks like uh, you're you're off to a good start and um, uh, congratulations on all the good work you do in working uh, farm to school and uh, and teaching people about mm -hmm. where their vegetables come from. I mean, right. it's, and if, it's Yeah, I was going to say if people want to learn more and, and maybe help you out, Gary, what's the best way to reach you? Yeah, just go to the website, uh, greenschoolfarms.com, and also Facebook, uh, same thing, Green School Farms, all one word. So, Right, and, and those uh, the link to Green School Farms is on my blog post in case you forget, or just write to me and I'll, I'll pass it along because yeah. I want people to know about you and to support your work. Um, and uh, if they want to come out and help harvest, I, I'm sure you would accept their help. Yeah, yeah, totally. Totally okay. fun. I mean, and, and I want to thank you guys. I mean, this is an awesome show that, you know, you're always highlighting environmental topics and keeping it in the forefront. And I'm just, I'm just thrilled that, you know, you wanted to, you know, have a few minutes to talk. So thank you so much. Well, you you filled up an hour for us. You know, I, all I had to do is, <laughs> is wind you up and let you go. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't had to do much except hit the wrong button every now and then. So, uh, okay. all right, Gary hopefully Fair. We can, hopefully we can stay in touch with you this summer, Gary. Oh, yeah. Listen, you know yeah, what? Totally. We we should follow up uh, mid-season to see how the crops are doing and then maybe even okay. harvest. Uh, I think uh, yeah. I would love to see this again. So uh, I want to I want to get back when it's a little bit greener. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Gary, you have a great Sunday. Okay. Enjoy the 70-degree weather when it shows up. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. It's the Mike Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We'll be back with uh, the green whatever in just a couple of minutes. Hey, it's my favorite entomologist, Dr. Riley. How are you doing today? Hey, Victor. I'm doing great. How about yourself? Pretty good. Hey, I was out here the other day, and it was snowing about 20 degrees. It was freezing cold. And underneath this rock, I found what appears to be a perfectly live adult cricket. And it just got me to thinking, how do some insects make it through the cold winter months? Yeah, it's a great question, Victor. So we use the term overwintering to describe how insects navigate the challenges of winter months and successfully make it out on the other side. And generally speaking, when we talk about insects overwintering, there's two different approaches. So the first approach is what we might consider get out of dodge. And monarch butterflies are a great example of this for how they'll travel thousands of miles to Mexico to try to escape the cold winter months. That sounds great. I don't think this cricket's gonna hop its way all the way down to Mexico. So what about the insects that stick around? 
Yeah, so for the ones that stick around, many are going to try to find shelter in some type of protected environment. Areas like leaf litter, the upper few inches of soil, or even inside of man-made structures. Like our attics or sheds or something like that? Yep, exactly. Plenty of insects will try to creep their way inside any type of warm, insulated structure as it gets into the colder months. So another example of an insect that has kind of a unique approach to overwintering would be the boxwood leaf miner. In this case, boxwood leaf miners overwinter in their larval stage, and they actually spend the entire winter season protected within the confines of individual boxwood leaves. Interesting. So shelter sounds great, but does anything physiological happen to insects that help them out? Yeah, shelter is great, but insects can still be exposed to lethal freezing temperatures and have strategies to try to alter their physiology to either avoid freezing or resist freezing. So some will produce substances that are similar to antifreeze, while others will produce waxy protective coatings and cover themselves with it. With these different strategies, lots of insects can tolerate the cold winters of temperate ecosystems. So there's a whole lot of insect life here in this winter landscape, more than people may realize, but not a whole lot of activity in this season though, right? Yeah, yeah, great observation, but this is actually a great time to have an arborist on site. A uh, trained arborist can help survey plant material, observe signs and symptoms of insect activity from earlier in the year, and begin to help you develop a strategy to try to care for and maintain your plants. Wow, very interesting. Hey, Dr. Riley, I want to thank you for your time. And uh, as always, thanks for being a resource for our arborists here at Bartlett Tree Experts. Yeah, my pleasure, Victor. Welcome to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio with just a soup song of humor. Or is that a dash? Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Here they are again, Peggy Malecki and Mike Novak. All I need is good food to eat and make me healthy, wealthy, wide awake. Lettuce, tomatoes, root, and bacon. What about those sweet potatoes? All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good tools to make me music, porches, lawn serene. Give me all that I can take. And welcome back to the show. Was that awesome or what? Mm -hmm. Just that was a lot of fun. Yeah. I think our viewers uh, really appreciated that too. And, 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 And all of that, I forgot that I could have been showing photos too, but he was so interesting. Yeah. Um, but I do want to let you know that uh, Gary is capable of growing really wonderful vegetables. Like for instance, how about uh, them carrots? Um, those look great. Um, these are some mm-hmm. of the photos that he had sent me and some of his tomatoes. Um, I like, I love this next photo. This is, this says it all there. <laughs> Woo-hoo! That seems to be Gary. He's uh, in love with life and um, um, and and his vegetables and his farm. Um, and I think I have one of him at one of the uh, sales. Here we are uh, with masks and everything. I mean, this is uh, this is uh, what it looks like when he's actually when stuff is actually growing yeah. during the season. I peppers there yeah yeah and some brussels sprouts um it's just uh i think those are brussels sprouts aren't they sure look like it uh those are those are peppers are those pep oh yeah you're right you're right they're green peppers yeah, yeah. i'm sorry and and red peppers as well um so just um very nice very great. um yeah uh i'm i'm impressed and and i think our folks uh, who are watching this are right. He uh, he really does need to run for office. I think he could be senator uh, from Nebraska. They could use somebody uh, like that. That would be uh, a, a very, very good thing. Uh, uh, but he's having fun doing this. Yeah, stop. Senator? Yeah, really. It's, I, I love the idea that he just started, you know, breaking out in hives when we mentioned uh, political yeah. office. So. Uh, hey, we've got less than a half an hour uh, until countdown on, which means we're going to break a little bit early because I want to do the countdown uh, right at uh, as we get to uh, ten thirty three Central Standard yeah. Time. No, Central Daylight Time. Oh boy! Well, let's start there. Okay, the, the whole daylight <laughs> saving time is still um, 
it's weird, okay? Because I, I have a story that um, was in the Washington Post about sleep. Ex- Here's the headline. Mm-hmm. Sleep experts say Senate has it wrong. Standard time, not daylight saving, should be permanent. Uh, and that is going to be, because you're on the other side of that, Peggy. Yep. You, you And are- I have seen other articles speaking to the other side of it. Uh-huh. Well, it's it's very interesting. Uh, the I don't know if your folks realize it, but this week the U.S. Senate voted to uh, make uh, daylight saving time permanent. Um, here's an interesting thing I also got from the Washington Post. It just came in this morning. Hot off the presses? Yeah, hot off the presses. Um, this was um, Dana Milbank wrote... Um, uh, about the unanimous Senate vote on March 15th, making daylight saving time permanent. Turns out, <laughs> this is this is our our Congress. Okay, They're, they they can't do anything right ever. Um, and uh, and it turns out the the vote was an accident. Um, quoting uh, Dana Milbank, he writes <laughs> the the Senate approved oh, legislation vote. Uh, I don't. Well, oh, what? Sorry, we didn't mean to vote. Sorry. <laughs> the Senate approved legislation making daylight saving time year round. There were no hearings, no discussions, no debate, and no vote. It just happened because nobody objected, in large part because many senators didn't even know it was happening. Yay! There's our there's our Congress. There's our U.S. Senate. Yay! You guys are. Were they like scratching their nose and their vote counted? What? Yeah, something like that. The, you know, the greatest deliberative body uh, on the planet. Woohoo! Except that they didn't even know what they were voting on, and nobody voted. So it was unanimous consent, apparently. And and somebody's. Uh, it's just nobody slowed it down. Nobody stopped it. We we need to find the. Um... What's the what's the cable station that shows all the votes? C-SPAN. C-SPAN. We need to find the C-SPAN video from this. Y- you know that would be interesting. I wonder if C- yeah. Well, somebody's going to uh, do something on this now that now that this has come out. Man, apparently uh, Nancy Pelosi is like, eh, we might get to it. Eh, I'm I'm not sure. I'm actually interested in this. And you go, girl. All right. I don't, I don't think it's a good idea. At least not without debate, at least not without okay, as you say, Peggy, some scientists you you say there are, there are scientists who say it's okay and the article all right, uh, let me call up the article I found because yeah, there is there, Dr. Z from the American That's Academy right. The, who is from Northwestern. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um and I, and I happen to know her name because she's quoted in in another article that <laughs> it's a, that's uh, that's that related to healthy sleep. I just I saw the name. I'm like, I've seen that name. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, while no time system will be perfect for everyone, making daylight t- saving time permanent would lead to a greater number of dark mornings. Of course, everybody wants the light evenings, but it'll lead to more dark mornings. Then we have now said Phyllis Z, uh, chief of sleep medicine at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. She says, with daylight saving time, we are perpetually out of synchronization with our internal clocks, and we often achieve less nighttime sleep, both circumstances having negative health impacts. Extra evening light suppresses the melatonin that should be preparing us for falling asleep. The later dawn during daylight saving time deprives our biological clocks of the critical light signal. She uh, goes on, it's it's really not a good thing to have your internal body clocks out of sync. Imagine being in jet lag a lot of the time. It can't be good for you. So, Some of the articles I've seen talk about, not everybody is on the same circadian rhythm. For people that are more night oriented and they get up later you're out of rhythm the rest of the year well i'm more night oriented than morning oriented uh, uh, one more thing from z uh, z said her heart sank when she saw the the news of the legislation passing 
I thought there would be more of a discussion that it wouldn't be <laughs> as you <laughs> that it wouldn't be unanimous of the. <laughs> uh, uh, I know. I mean, we can't get uh, a senator to get a hundred percent on. Uh, um, is it Tuesday? You know, um, and and she said of the three oh, not everywhere you got the international dateline. It might be Wednesday. You of, know. The, of the three <laughs> potential time systems for the country to be on: permanent standard, biannual switching, and permanent daylight saving time. She said the last is probably the worst choice. Go Senate! Yay! <laughs> Yay, America, USA, USA, USA. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So going back going back to our guest from the first hour, thank yes. you, um, viewer MB McMahon, who just went to Gary's website and bought a Green School Farms t-shirt. Good for you. You know what? I want one of those, too. I may have to go buy one. So everybody go buy a t-shirt. Um, go to Green School Farms um, and the... Uh, I think it's just greenschoolfarms.com. Or is it yeah, he's got a shop yeah. section up there yeah. with T-shirts. And he's, you know, and if you were there, if you lived in Nebraska, you could buy his vegetables as well. I don't mm -hmm. think you're going to get them here in uh, in the in Illinois <laughs> or in Deb California. Says, yeah, Deb goes, I get the feeling that Senators Mo, Larry, and Curly were challenged. Whoop, 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 that's yay u.s senate oh i love those guys they're they're crazy those crazy senators oh man they're just nuts oh dear okay next next uh yeah yeah i'm going back to bed uh oh it's light out oh what am i gonna do it's too light outside um the uh the two stories we're going to talk about with with rick that are uh we've got on the Green Report. And, and people are giving us, by the way, suggestions. Ooh, I've been writing them down, yep. Okay, what have we got so far? Uh, we've got Carolyn suggests Be Better Green. <laughs> With Amos suggests B -E -E, right? yes, Be Better Green. Yeah. Or like the bee buzz. Yep, 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 yep. Amos suggests The Green Place. Diana suggests Green Speak. I kind of like Green Speak. Yeah. Uh, it, and there was it, a few more that went through up there too. Uh, it's a, like a new language. Nobody understands it. Cer <laughs> Green speak. It's a language yeah. that conservatives do not understand. So um, one thing we did refer to in the first hour, we've got to make sure we get to, is the new uh, report. Carrie Gillum reported on her unspun blog, um, a not so appetizing report on weed killer in our food. And we should mention that she has been on our show in the past. Several times, yeah. Uh, you yeah. go ahead. You take you take the lead. Well, on I'm just one. trying to get it open here. So, um, and she reports on Unspun, which is her her blog. But uh, a report just came out Tuesday from the Environmental Working Group. Um, they found quote widespread contamination of common grocery store items with the controversial weed killing chemical called glyphosate, popularly known as Roundup. In a test of 86 food products sampled from groceries in Des Moines, Iowa. More than half, 45 of the products were found to contain what researchers called, quote, alarming levels of glyphosate, included whole wheat breads, which contained the highest levels, even sprouted, I, I went and read some of the report yesterday, even sprouted grain breads, which we tend to think of as very healthy. Um, chickpeas, Quaker oats also showed very high levels, according to the report. Um, the food sampled came from Walmart, Whole Foods, Hy-Vee, Target, and Natural Grocers, they're tested in a study commissioned by a group called the Detox Project, funded by the Rose Foundation. Um, and this is just an ongoing update to things we've reported on the show before about glyphosate being found in so many things, and a lot of it coming from the, um, the desiccant. Remember we had talked about like oats and other products just as they're ready to be farmed, uh, ready to be harvested, then right. they're sprayed to dry them out. To dry them out, right. Yep. That they just... Yep douse them with uh with glyphosate um yeah, they've been found it in honey and um um and there are so many different kinds of roundup now you can't believe how many different kinds because then they add all these extra chemicals in there it used to be it was just pretty much glyphosate and then they add surfactants and uh other chemicals to make mm -hmm. it last longer when when theoretically 
the whole point of Roundup was that it 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 broke down in the soil very quickly. Well, now if you're adding chemicals to keep it around longer, isn't that sort of defeating the whole idea of Roundup in the first place? Um, yeah. So, yeah, it is uh, disturbing uh, to see that. So uh, thanks for putting us, uh, making us aware of that. Um, something else that we reported on uh, several weeks ago when we had uh, MWRD Commissioner Kim Dubuclé on the program uh, is uh, she talked about how they were working with UIC uh, to uh, test wastewater for uh, COVID and other, mostly COVID, I guess. I don't know if it's other uh, virus diseases. and Yeah, and, it probably and, tracks some other things, but yeah, mostly COVID. Yeah, but um, so a couple of stories about this that we linked to. One of them is, is Axios, um, percentage of change in COVID-19 levels detected in Illinois wastewater treatments plants uh, and in the Chicago area, it's up, way up. Um, and this is happening uh, also across the country. Milwaukee is also having a spike, uh, which, which tells us, even though the COVID numbers are going down here, the wastewater is predicting, basically, that the numbers might go back up again. Um, uh, two recent wastewater samples from the city and northwest suburbs showed a 1,000% increase in the presence of the virus over this two weeks. The, the variant. Um, yes. Um, I don't think it matters, though, really. Uh, does it? Which variant it is? Well, I, if I read them correctly, it's that new variant. Yeah. Well, Omicron and, the, the BA.2. Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, the uh, the uh, head of uh, uh, the Chicago's health department, Allison Arwadi, um, says she won't be surprised to see local cases rise with the recent relaxation of mask and vaccine mandates. So this is at a point where everybody says, well, we're done. You know, as if we didn't see this before as if we hadn't gone through this a couple of times already, uh, and people just, well, because I want it to be done yeah, in my we're, brain. Yeah, we're tired of it. We're just tired of it. Yeah, yeah we're, we're moving we're on. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're on. We're just tired, yeah. I, for one, am wearing masks everywhere I go, uh, indoors. Um, and I'm not going to stop for a while. That's not going to happen. Um, I'm doing a talk. I'm doing a garden talk uh, this Friday. And I'm going to be wearing a mask. And I already told them, I said, I'm going to be, and they were cool about it. They said, you know, we think a lot of our folks will be wearing masks too, mm -hmm. but I'm betting some won't. Went, okay. Yep. Well, uh, but uh, this is interesting. A lot of because it depends where you go too. I've just noticed around the area, some places, almost everyone still has masks on and other places they look at you like, what's that? Well, because I'm not out of the city very much myself. Um, I, you know, in Chicago, there's still a lot, although yeah, in, in some places there are people who are not, and I'm always trying to judge who, who are these people who have decided that they are bulletproof. They're done. <laughs> yeah, they're done. We're tired of it. We want to move on. So, uh, what we're, I might just want to see the cities in the Newsweek article, Orlando, mm -hmm. um, Chicago, Seattle, and Milwaukee are some of the most prominent cities showing a high spread of COVID-19. So uh, this is something... I wonder why, specifically. The, uh, who knows? Locations. You know what? Yeah. There, to some degree, there's no rhyme or reason. Who, mm -hmm. who showed up from out of town? Who went where? Um, mm -hmm. Although we do know that um, the red states tend to have a higher incidence of of uh, COVID than the blue states, so. And everyone's on spring break right now, traveling all over the place, so. Because it's spring break and the world is back to normal. All right, here's another one that is uh, interesting because, um, well, there's, there's this uh, race to put a casino in Chicago, okay? Which in itself is... I guess if, if, if all you think about is money and funding the city could be a good thing. But if you realize what harm casinos can cause mm -hmm. too, 
There are a lot of people who say, no, that's not, that's actually not a good thing. So Friends of the Parks uh, in the Chicago Sun-Times, I saw this the other day and I was kind of surprised. In a letter to supporters and contributors, Friends of the Park Executive Director Juanita Irizarry, who has been on our show a number of times, made a point-by-point argument for why the plan by casino magnate Neil Bloom was the best of five competing proposals, and that would put a casino at McCormick Place, the old one, the the yeah, aircraft, the lakeside. the lakeside, the aircraft carrier on the lake, which already kills tons of birds uh, every year. And it's, it's uh, huge reflective windows right next to the migration and I, path. And can you imagine a casino being put there? Of course, they would have bright lights facing Lakeshore Drive that Mm -hmm. side of it because they want to advertise the casino, but they're not going to keep the lakeside part of it dark. They're going to put bright lights there on the lakeside part of it. I mean, that's, that's what casinos do. And earlier in the week, I had seen a tweet and Mm -hmm. I responded, I retweeted from a number of people, um, including, well, they wrote a, a, an op-ed piece for the Chicago Tribune, and it was uh, Jerry Edelman from Open Lands, uh, Judy Pollock, both of mm-hmm. whom have been on our show, Annette Prince, who we had on our show recently from the Chicago mm-hmm. Bird Collision Monitor, and Doug Monitor, Stotts. And Doug Stotts. Yeah. All of, all of, they've all been them. on our show, <laughs> all right? And they did an op-ed piece saying this is a terrible idea um, of... of um, They say, with the impending decision on where to house a proposed casino in the city, imagine what flying into Chicago would look like with the casino on the lakefront. Bright lights emanating from the shores. For wildlife like birds, this decision is a matter of life and death. Chicago is the most dangerous city in North America for migrating birds, according to the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. And McCormick Place's Lakeside Center is documented as one of the worst buildings in the city for bird mortality. Birds are attracted to city lights. They then collide with glass on buildings because it is either transparent or it mirrors a clear sky. I don't know what's going on here, but it's odd that the two, these two environmental groups seem to have, seem to be at odds. Um, And this is an ad hoc group of, of these four people who wrote this op-ed piece, but they're all quite, um smart and Mm -hmm. and influential and yet friends of the park is very influential in this and i don't understand and i we might might need to have one yeah what's your guess is they're coming from the this is already a piece of property that's been developed that's sitting there versus developing another casino on open land on parkland yeah that's my guess. They're coming from a building reuse sustainability standpoint, but it's not considering the same things that the other groups are considering. Well, and I also know that reading what uh, the Friends of the Parks has said, th- there will be some more parkland added, and this is what they want to see as well. So they're, they're, it seems like their focus is on, we're going to get more parkland out of this. But we also have to take in consideration what those lights are going to do Yep. to the Lakeside Center uh, at McCormick Place and uh, the, the impact that's going to have on bird yeah. birds flying yeah. by. So Yep, and if they make it past there, they can head to Carvana. So, <laughs> yeah, really, just continue on. All right, that's, uh, we need, I want to break right now because uh, we, when we come back, we're going to count down to, that's right, coming up, get ready, get your uh, ready to I go. Got- that thing didn't make any noise. I know it. I, I was being very careful. And then I can make noise later. It's the Mike Novak Show okay. with Peggy Malecki. Spring begins when we return. 
from spring seed and soil treatments to summer foliar feeding to fall stubble digesters, Blazing Star provides microbial tools from tiny biologicals for natural and organic farmers. They have solutions for home gardeners too. And Blazing Star also offers agroecological education and consulting, especially for permaculture work in zones four and five. Learn more about these great folks and great techniques at blazing-star.com. One of the other advantages in using our Happy Leaf lights to grow your tomatoes at home is they use very little energy. Um, they're using about 30 watts of energy, so if they're on for 16 hours a day, it's less than a nickel per day to run the lights. All the other costs are some seeds, some nutrients, which are also very inexpensive, and um, you can actually grow your own tomatoes that are pesticide free indoors, in your basement, in a closet, anywhere you want, and we are showing you how to do that. On the 22nd of March, we will celebrate World Water Day, and this year's theme is Groundwater, Making the Invisible Visible. And you can help making the invisible visible too. Grab your phone or camera and show how groundwater affects your daily life. Is there enough? Is it safe to use? Who uses the most groundwater in your area? And what needs to be done to exploit and protect groundwater? The five most compelling stories will at the end of the year be shown to over 300 policymakers at the UN Water Summit on Groundwater. You can have your voice heard and make a difference. So, how can you join? Shoot the video on landscape orientation. Go into the field and show your groundwater story. Use a mic for good quality audio. Keep your video respectful and keep your video to 60 seconds or less, unlike me. And follow these three steps. Upload your video to YouTube or Vimeo. Then share it on social media using these hashtags and send the video link to this email address. Good luck, together we can make the invisible visible. And welcome back. And uh, we're, I'm sure, uh, I haven't even checked to see if uh, Rick is here. I don't, I don't think he is yet. Oh, look at that, he, he's coming up. So um, as uh, we can fade this up but we're we're just about a minute away and uh <laughs> maybe we should have jacks there is what we need oh there you are hey rick we're about to do a countdown to uh to spring to the uh oh spring lovely. solstice um and uh yeah uh so let me get uh it's I, i've got the world clock yes, up yeah. here uh we got me... you got three months to go for the solstice so it should be the equinox Oh, I'm sorry. The equinox. Sorry, I meant the equinox. Okay, where is it? Where's my? Uh... Or solstice in some places. Equinox. All right. Yeah. Boy, that went over, that went over like a lead balloon. Oh, uh, sorry. Your your audio's breaking up, Rick. That's part of it. Yeah. So you know the uh, yeah, I meant the 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 equinox, uh, which means equal somehow. Um, all right. Uh, coming up in ten seconds, we, we will begin the countdown. Everybody, stand by uh, for spring. Uh, and that is about to begin right now. <laughs> well, there not, not much. <laughs> Well done. Uh, all well right, done. we're in spring. I, my favorite part is uh, is this little cat uh, at the end of this. Oh, we'll just, uh, I don't know what that little cat is doing up there in that. Uh, Having uh, fun. Just, uh, that's, that's the best part is the, the little cat there up in the, whatever that clock is holding. All right. We have no idea. 
it's just, I'm just going to leave the little cat up there. It's just too too much fun. Uh, welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Mlecky. Okay, I've got one more thing here uh, for you guys. That and I was uh, going to say thanks thanks for um, ordering up a beautiful spring blue sky outside for us today, Rick, for the first day of spring. Yes. Oh, it was. Um, I took my dog out, Jax, for a walk earlier, and uh, there was frost in some areas, mm -hmm. uh, a light haze and light fog in others. Um, yep. And the ground, um, even though it's kind of still wet from yesterday's rain and Friday's rain, uh, the photosynthesis is definitely uh, becoming apparent. Have you noticed, Peg, the things are becoming yep. a little bit darker, greener? Yep. yep. Mike's, oh, Mike's oh, got another surprise for us, too, here. Oh, boy, wait a second. But I got to tell you, my, daf the, oh, my whole front parkway and yard in the last two days, I think it had something to do with the rain just the mm -hmm. daffodils has just gone and yep. shot up and yeah. I've got these huge clumps of green now. So, um, yeah. it, spring is really on the way. Okay. So yeah. this is, here's one more thing that I put together because we talked last week. I don't know if you remember, um, about sneezing on the, on the air. Uh, <laughs> what was you, that? That was good. Wow. <laughs> Give the man. I didn't uh, I missed that. Some people, some people can, can cry on cue and Rick DeMaio can sneeze on cue. All right. Uh, and sure enough, I went to YouTube and I found this and of course. I, and I put That's some, YouTube. this is, uh oh, Jax, you're going to enjoy this. All right. <laughs> Go Jax. Um, uh, and it's a little, it's a little compilation. I put to the, the last one in particular, I think you'll find pretty amusing. So once we get below that magic number of 32 for a couple of hours, it can turn icy. We're not seeing that this morning, but I do think there will be a better chance tomorrow morning at this time. Uh oh, she's holding this it in. Keep up with mother wow. nature, but... Oh, excuse me, I thought I was going to see. This is definitely going to be a... <laughs> this is the second time. That is due to the weather. And then for JFK... <laughs> excuse me. You're showing... <coughs> excuse me. Uh, thank you. <laughs> the precipitation a little heavier. Right now we're in the 30s. It's... Th I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm so sorry. All right, Norman. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> you know what? I just want to say per hour. Now, that's because uh, we're seeing a change in the guard. High pressure taking back over the region. This is going to allow for more stability. <coughs> uh, uh, that is disgusting. I am so sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, moving on. Uh, here's what you need to know. I do look for that. Excuse me, y'all. I'm so sorry. 51 degrees. Excuse me. I can't help it. Excuse me. Okay, let's get back to the forecast. Earlier crash outside of town on the I-15. Pardon me. Excuse me. <laughs> A live sneeze. <laughs> wow. Eight sneeze now. Our forecast overnight, we'll see the rain moving out slowly from west to east. So those of you in eastern uh, Massachusetts, you're going to hold on to the rain just a little bit longer. I'm, just, I'm going to sneeze. That is the okay. first time. That's the ever? first time I've ever sneezed. 25 years of doing this. Wow, you need a tissue? Oh, you know what it was? I, I ate some cashews before I came on. <laughs> <laughs> I got stuck. Then on Friday, lots of cloud cover and a storm system. <laughs> oh. Oh, excuse me. Oh, <laughs> moving in from Fargo east towards Park Rapids, making those folks get out their umbrellas and galoshes. We got a... We got a hot... <coughs> oh, God. What's in the... Oh, man. What's going on in here today? Oh, wow. Okay, all sorts of stuff going on right now. Oh. All right, we got a high wind watch until Saturday in central and east North Dakota. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, everything, everything is all in my eyes, all down my, what is happening? Who, oh, good Lord. Oh God, that stings. What, who sprayed something in here? Jesus Christ. Like, is there pepper spray in here? Oh man, okay, okay. Can't see, can't see, gonna, 
Oh, give me a second. Everything hurts. Can't read. Ah, okay. <laughs> How about cut back to the anchors, camera people? Oh, my. Uh, and Jax loves it. Uh, we're getting a thumbs up, a paw up from, from Jax. There. That poor woman at the last one, holy smoke. That It's amazing they didn't cut away from her. Yeah. Uh, they just sort well, of let her. Uh, it's and North Dakota Television. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's North Dakota Television, the most exciting thing. Um, stuff they had on there for a while, so it makes sense, right? <laughs> oh dear. Okay, for all you folks watching in North Dakota, uh, I want to sneeze now. I think. <laughs> uh, so there you go. At I, I, I knew that there was something out there, and uh, this is. Um, you spent time doing that. I did, because I, I, I was entertaining myself. Uh, I, I had to entertain myself. Maybe, uh, maybe you need to post that little compilation right there on YouTube. Uh, um, what? Who? <laughs> Post that compilation on YouTube. Nah, you know, other people have done it. I took I took parts of other people's compilations, and I and I did the wor the worst of the worst. And by the way, um, uh, <laughs> Jill uh, says, Rick, you look like you just got out of bed. I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just I, I I've I've been grading um, climate change presentation from Loyola, and I did. Just didn't get a chance to uh, do my normal shower. Quaff. He didn't quaff this Mike morning. So, uh, all right, I didn't quaff this morning. Sorry about. That. Oh, that's that's okay, but uh, I I don't care about the quaff. I'm I'm more interested in the signal we're getting, which is uh, pretty rough today uh, from your place. Um, so uh, we'll see we'll see how this holds up. Uh, we actually we had a guy we had our farmer out in the middle of his fields in Nebraska who was getting a pretty right. pretty good signal uh, today. So we'll do what we can. But uh, some of the stuff that you told us about, I want to pop this up because this is really interesting stuff uh in antarctica uh and yeah. what is that blob of red there uh well peg actually uh sent me information on this that i had already gotten a uh, day before but it was basically um temperatures that are nearly uh 30 degrees centigrade above now i have not gone into the details of why, but this is just remarkable stuff uh, that this area of Antarctica was this warm. I mean, I, I don't know. All, all I know, um, I saw some of the reports about it, um, and then I went on to uh, Climate Reanalyzer, uh, which is out of the um, University of Maine. You can see the link down there in the bottom right. So Climate Reanalyzer is a fantastic from the University of Maine. And you can look at basically all, uh, but yeah, it was uh, 32 degrees centigrade um, above normal, which is almost 50 degrees or 55 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. Again, I don't know why uh, it was like this. I haven't gone into it uh, too much. I was trying to, I'm kind of behind about a day on my grading, which is why I got up this morning and was doing it pretty much from 8.30 until about 10.30. Uh, but what I, I did find when out, the atmospheric river came in. It was just this an anomalous atmospheric river, all converging. So it was more. Yeah, it was more. Yeah, it was more of a flow off uh, that did, and that's the only way you're going to get that warm um, at the surface. So the atmospheric river that Peg is referring to is a moisture that we typically hear about, like in the Pacific Northwest or in California. Um, and this happened to be something that moved into the areas of Antarctica where they have temperature measurement devices um, available to get that. Now you can you can sometimes get it from satellite technology, but I don't think it's I don't think it's highly I don't think it's readily available. We don't really have satellites that show that much of the Antarctic. Um, I know there's some upper air reports that you can get from there, but I have not looked at that. But yeah, pretty remarkable nonetheless. Yeah. I think the article I I think it was the article I sent, unless it was the one you sent, did have one satellite, enhanced satellite view of this just whew, river of clouds and air going through. And uh, now, yeah. this, what, what would have caused this? I mean, is this any, is our climate change related to things like this? Does this have any long-term effect or is it just an anomaly? 
I, I, um, I, I think probably more just an anomaly. Now, it doesn't mean it has happened before. Again, um, I never like to look at one event and relate it to climate change. I think you have to look at trends. So if this is the third time we've seen this in the last 10 years, it's definitely a trend. Uh, but the only way you would get this is if you have some sort of a bogging down atmospheric flow, meaning that you can't have just one big storm. You need like to have something um, something that's stuck in place that allows that flow to be there for one, two, maybe three days. Um, and uh, again, it, it would be remarkable to go in there and look at it with a little bit of detail because it is it is pretty fascinating. Now, well, the uh, U.S. Storm Watch called it unfathomable temperatures, and uh, right. one of, one of the most anomalous extreme temperature events ever observed in human history. Yeah. Now, human history for the Antarctic goes back to about 1957. Uh, that's when <laughs> yeah. we first started. Yeah. yeah that's, that, that's when we first started measuring. Yeah. That's when we first started measuring temperatures down there. That was the the year, the geophysical year. Yeah. Um, great they, movie they about that. I'm sorry, Rick, ahead, I was going to say, they also, I believe, recorded at the same weather station the lowest temperature ever recorded on record. Um, and this was when? Not, not recently, right? Sometime in the last couple of years. So it's either that article or another one. I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me because I... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it'll be, I mean, I could, I could look at that and we could talk more about it. I hate to just flippantly discuss it without having real knowledge about it, but... What was the um, movie you were talking about? Yeah, the movie is called Ice and Sky. Um, it's a great movie that came out about five or six years ago. Um, it's about Claude Laurier, who was one of the first um, glaciologists to come to um, Antarctica. And him and three other men uh, in 1957 were able to um, extract data, um, you know, from the atmosphere, you know, from high above, from the surface. Um, you know, liquid content of the of, of the snow, uh, the different type of crystal. The first ones to do ice core samples in 1958 and 59, and they were the first ones to really understand that you can get CO2 from ice core samples. So again, ice and sky, and it really is remarkable. Uh, yeah, ice, yeah, I, Antarctica, ice and sky, 2015. I'll put the link up in the feed here. Yeah. Yeah, twenty. Yeah, I think they actually have it at the music box, and I show it to my students every semester, and it, and it really is um, amazing from my of what they are actually able to accomplish. Um, think about it: men literally living underground, under the surface for about five months during the Antarctic summer, just just collect data, um, and then and then they decided to go across. The Antarctic to another part, and then basically in the mountains, the crevices or crevasses, as they call them. Uh, but it was truly the first time they ever did, you know, measurement in Antarctica. So, um, it, it's mm. remarkable to watch. Uh, uh, yeah. All right, and it was only 1957. It wasn't that long ago. It, that that is uh, it does put things in perspective. Now, the other big uh, story of the week is this image. Um, and the report that came out from uh, climate.gov about the U.S. spring outlook for 2022 and how the drought is to expand or at least remain the same. Um, and this is their prediction uh, for drought uh, in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, it's, uh, if you look at the brown area, and I need my glasses to, to see this at the top. That is persists. That's where the drought persists. Uh, yeah. the, the yellow uh, or gold is where development is likely, which is a much smaller area. Uh, the tan is remains but improves, and removal likely, uh, which is over us, uh, according to. Right, right. So um, it's still. Uh, what are they saying? Like 60% of the country uh, involved in some kind of drought. Yeah. This is the first time since 2012, 10 years ago that we've had more than 10% of the country um, in drought. Um, and, or I think in severe drought, I think that's what it is. It might be drought or severe drought. Nonetheless, um, that's the last time that we had massive uh, crop loss in the United States. 
Um, had, you know, the lowest levels of the Great Lakes in over 30 years. Um, and also you had, you know, massive wildfires out west. So 2012 was also a year we had 46 days above 90 here in Chicago. That's the year we had uh, seven days in a row of above 80 degrees or be at least above 75 in the month of March. Um, and we started out dry and we just stay dry. Um, I don't think that's going to happen here in the Midwest. It looks different um, only because our spring is much wetter than it was back in 2012. But for places out West, this is, this is a big deal. And um, one of the things that my Loyola students were doing uh, is did their, their climate projects on national parks. Uh, mm -hmm. There was Yellowstone, Zion, uh, Glacier, Olympic, um, Grand Canyon, and Yosemite was the parks that were chosen in the Western United States. And it was great that all of these students would look at the trend of the population of the parks was increasing dramatically up until COVID. Um, and then it actually went down, went up down, but then dramatically increased when the parks opened up last year. That was early in the year. And then because of the wild fucked off dramatically. So what the students are learning here is that the national parks and all of the cities and towns surrounding the parks are greatly impacted uh, by a changing and more variable climate. And this is one of the ways that I try to get students who are not not, not so much uh, environmentally things, these are non-science majors, to become aware of it, both from a from, from an environmental standpoint, but also from an economic standpoint as well. So their job is to pretty much go in and find out which of the park is economic impacted by a more and more variable climate, and then all of the summit. So they basically use this chart. Here's really what, what should be shown first, because this is analysis that you just showed was more of a prediction. And then when you start to see this, you also begin to wor worry about, uh, you know, the wheat crop that may not uh, be as healthy uh, this year and what's happening with wheat worldwide. It's going up due to the invasion of Ukraine. So you really get to see a much more well-rounded understanding of how climate change, climate variability, um, and then the economy from a standpoint of hospitality, you know, hotels, rest camping, you know, just, just basic vacation uh, and also agriculture is linked. And uh, again, you know, we can get into discussion about energy at another time today to do that. But this is where you're not kind of jumping on the climate bandwagon, just picking them and cleaning off layers of things that exist out there and they already know about. Um, and then they kind of think about a little bit more um, from a standpoint of the most common, everything thinks about how climate and the environment affect us. Uh, and uh, here's some more of the predictions. Uh, well, well, for spring uh, from uh, from climate.gov, uh, and this is the temperature outlook. Now, how much stock do you take in this kind of a prediction? We just saw the drought. Oh, oh quite a bit, because this is the April, May, and June temperature outlook. So this is 90 days out. Um, and this is uh, pretty much what you would expect with a line pattern, uh, which is the jet stream coming in from the north and west. Uh, that's been the case pretty much since about January. So La Nina had really kicked into gear um, in the fall, but we had such a warm flow of water coming in off the Pacific Ocean that we ended up having an Asterisk River produce phenomenal amounts of snow in California. But once that jet stream pushed north and the north and west, which is what it was supposed to do, California went into a drought. Uh, so typically, California will get um, a dry, or well, well I shouldn't say get, usually experience drier weather during a La Nina pattern than an El Nino. However, the changing climate, um, La Ninas and El Ninos are what they used to be. And that's one of the more difficult things in just saying El Nino or La Nina. However, with this particular pattern, this is a La Nina pattern that's still kind of ongoing, but beginning to weaken somewhat. 
And the fact that the flow of air is coming in from the north and west, not only is it, is it warm in that area, but you can see the chances of it be staying dry than normal through the end of June, which is what the spring outlook was showing, uh, does not bode well. So one of the things that the students had to do was they had to look at um, past climate. They had to look at um, things that hurt the, um, the, the ability for the parks to remain open during the wildfires. And if it's already dry, meaning that you're using current data to then support what you're going to do for the upcoming spring and summer season, how is your park going to adapt? So in other words, it's basically putting the students in a role of being a park manager. At what point do you use science that is past and science that is present and science that's in the future to make decisions on how you will run your park? And they have a rubric and they have, you know, eight students get together and they have 20 minutes to present their stuff. And some of them hit home runs and some of them hit triples and doubles uh, is the way it goes. But it to me, it, it's exciting that I'm able to give them um, a task, which they have about four and a half to five weeks to do. And they have different homework mm -hmm. signs that lead up to that. Um, but it allows them to focus on science and not hear all this garbage from you know, radio stations and cable stations, which students of today don't watch. I mean, college kids do not watch all that garbage television. They don't. They don't even watch TV. So it, 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 it enables me, it gives me the opportunity and the chance to kind of mold them into becoming good reporters, so to say. Um, and there were a few times that students were like, I couldn't get the information that you wanted. I go, pick up the phone and call them. And they did. And they actually got to the phone of, you know. That's uh, great. A, 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 oh, yeah. They, they were talking to a ranger in, in Glacier National Park about what they expect to do for the upcoming season. And yeah. they were like, I couldn't believe that I actually got to talk to them. I go, the year that you will. Because they're usually back into the, um, uh, the, the ranger station because the roads are open. And you're not going to get many people visit the parks in – um, March, April, and May because it's that's mud the best, season. That's the best time, though, because there are fewer people, you know. it's a, You get to actually <laughs> see. You know, one of our, our viewers just wrote, parks are being overwhelmed. They need a lottery system. Um, and it, we might get to that point. Yeah. But, and now it's great. You can, you can drive through the parks. You just can't, you just can't hike the trails. Right. Um, so, the yeah, the mud season is horrible this time of the year. But you have so many people coming to the parks, or I should say, um, the workers coming into like literally trying to get the park open again. So, and, and, and a lot of this is actually built off of during the Obama years when he really kind of implemented the national part of this 100th year anniversary and really made people understand all the different things that are behind the parks. It's not just going there and through and driving out, but using it and understanding. Um, and you know what? I, I still remember the first time I aspired to go to a national park it was when I was in the map room at the University of Wisconsin and some graduate student, and on the shirt it said, I'm a glacier. And I looked up and I'm like, climb a glacier? Where do you do those? Oh, Glacier National Park in Montana. I'm like, I got to go. Um, and since then, um, that's that's what I've been doing as, as often as I can is to go see the glaciers. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna have you do a forecast. Your your signal's pretty bad uh, this morning, and yeah, and I uh, just VMix just dropped on me. I just came back on. All right, so I I don't know what's going on here. Let's uh let's let's do a forecast, and uh, I'll let you go grade some papers. <laughs> sure. Um, so again, um, we had quite a bit of wetness uh, last week. Uh, it cooled off a little bit. We had two days of seventy degrees. Um, we had two days of 70. We'll get we'll get more rain um, around here this upcoming week, um, and it looks like temperatures most likely 50s today, 60s tomorrow, maybe 70s by Tuesday before we get rain Wednesday, Thursday before it clears out on Friday. All right, that's that's pretty simple. Okay, I guess you could go back and and do your papers because you're 
you're frozen in the screen. We're going to talk. I need you. Get, um, uh, Ron Calgill said you got to do an Ethernet cable to your modem. I think that would be the best way to, to do it with the computer. But you and I can talk about that. Sounds good. All right. Take care. I hope, you, hope you survive uh, the students. Um, and there he goes. And um, um, just uh, one of our listeners, uh, William, just kind of went off on a rant there on on the chat about daylight saving time. I think he misunderstood what I said about Nancy Pelosi. Basically, I was like applauding her that she's got better things to do than to to worry about the dumb things that the Senate does. So uh, I don't think uh, uh, at any rate, um, that's uh, neither here nor there. So let's hit the road. All right. And um, thanks. Uh, all right, I'm ready for spring. Well, it's, it is. It's already spring. Wait. Okay. Uh, thanks to uh, Gary Fair. What a fun conversation that was with him. I'm going to do a special segment of that and, and post yeah. that. Thanks to meteorologist Rick DeMaio, who jumped out of bed to do a report. Thanks to Kathleen. <laughs> thanks to, uh, you know, uh, Legata and basil the dog um all of our viewers all of our viewers even if they're go ranting subscribe at us. on go subscribe to our youtube channel until next time go green or go home uh, stadler oh uh, what is that it yes it's over how'd you like it i don't know i slept through the whole thing well you didn't miss much